Good day to everyone. Today, I want to discuss a topic that's very close to my heart. I just attended the Attach conference in Virginia Beach. Um, and of course, Attach is all about attachment and connecting and, and making sure that we can have a thriving, have thriving relationships together. So um, what really struck me in so many of the discussions there was the talk about attunement, the talk about regulation, the talk about having difficulties with this aspect of what regulation is and what it's not, how to inhibit it, how to work with it. Um, so I thought I'll spend a couple of moments on that um, with you today. Before we can really understand that fully, um, we need to sort of say to ourselves, what is actual self-regulation? So when we think about self-regulation, it is about self-control. It's about the ability that I have in my body to know, okay, well, just calm down, just calm down. That when I tell myself, I can feel the feeling and I can take my deep breaths and I can hold it there and I can control it in a good way. And some of us have a better ability to do that than others. There's a whole continuum of different adaptive responses to this whole term self-regulation. The bottom line is that self-regulation is really only fully developed by the age of 26 alongside our other beautiful executive functioning skills. It's available really by about the age of four because that executive pathway is, is alive and well and getting, getting us ready to be able to attend school and, and, and behave in a way that we want to behave and perform in the way that we want to perform. So, but that self-regulation is not something that just simply happens by osmosis, as I'm sure many of you have seen. It is something that comes from a principle called co-regulation. When I co-regulate somebody, I model for them what it means to look and feel calm. And so co-regulation um, brings and drives us to this place of connection. Any one of us want to connect. What's that saying? No man is an island. We all want to connect. The children that we see in our offices, the families that we see in our offices are no different. Everybody wants to connect. But in today's society, there's such an emphasis on correct instead of connect. Connection is when I, as an adult, show a child that I get that you're going through a hard time and look at me, I'm showing you what it means to feel calm. I'm modeling for you what it feels to feel calm. It's so easy for us, any one of us, that when we face a child's upsetness, we want to get upset back. We may even get mad. We may even get anxious. We may even get, come on, you know, just, just chill, just calm down already, okay? And we don't really, in that moment, pay enough attention to the fact that our response is actually leading that over-arousal on. Um, so when we think about regulation, we need to think that in the nervous system, there is a sympathetic arousal system. That sympathetic arousal system is so crucial for us. It's what gets me up and going in the morning. It's what drives me to, to run that race. It, it's what drives me to, to complete my task today, right? Sympathetic arousal is important and we need sympathetic arousal. So if sympathetic arousal accelerates to a place where there is too much arousal, that is when we have a problem. Because when it's too much arousal, it feels icky and yucky in the body. And so therefore, I want that feeling to go away. And now I'm getting anxious because I don't know what to do to make it go away. And now I've become into a downward spiral. And before I know it, I'm out of control. 
So we need to put step our foot on the gas of the car to get the arousal, but we also need to know when to decelerate in order to get to a place that we can have a balance. And it's between the balance of acceleration and deceleration when I put my foot on the gas pedal in my car that I can keep my body in a even keel at 60 miles per hour if need be. And I can pace and hold myself through what the activity demand is on me. So this, um, when this sympathetic nervous system takes over, do we even think about what is the child's experience in that moment? What's really happening to the child then? The child feels fragmented. The child feels like information's coming in at different dosages, and I can't make sense of it. And I hear my mother speaking. I hear my teacher's voice. I hear my peer talking to me. It's like the words doesn't make sense. I'm just feeling flooded. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling like I got to get out of here. I got to. And if you don't get out of my way, I'm going to punch you, right? The fight and flight takes over. And it becomes some feeling that neither you nor I ever want to feel. If we can totally put our mind in the mind of the child, what are they experiencing in that moment? Do we really think that they want to feel that way? No. The bridge between co-regulation and self-regulation has not occurred yet. Therefore, we cannot expect them to calm down unless we co-regulate them to a place of calm down. When we give them the experience of what it feels like to calm down, and over time, they tackle the very same activities that they didn't want to tackle before, and they tackle it now with some modicum of success, and then with more success, those successful activities becomes the building of resilience, especially when we see them have a hard time. We say to them, I get it. I get it. I'm here. I'm here. I can't overtake your frustration. I can't overtake your dysregulation. I cannot fix you. I cannot do it for you. But I'll be here. And I'll be present. And I'll give you the message. I'm sticking by you. Then when the child comes down to say, that was really hard. That was really hard. So when we do that in an empathetic way, in an attuned way, the child gets the model of what it means to feel calm what it looks like to become. And they also get the feeling of now I am more rested. So sometimes I would point out to the child, well, it looks like it looks like you're not saying all those words anymore. I'm not hearing you say that. It looks like you're not um, kicking out with your foot anymore. I sort of mentioned something, maybe the breathing or anything, simply to let them know that their body has responded so that I can build the body awareness for that um, place of understanding what I just gone through and what this feeling feels like when I am calm. What we don't understand is that anxious kids have got no idea what we mean when we say calm down. They only know vigilance, they only know anxiety. So how, how can they calm down? They don't know what it feels like. I know right now when I go home tonight, I can sit up my feet and I can feel right now what it feels like when I relax. Our anxious kids cannot do that. What they know is this continuous feeling that something can erupt, something can happen. I'm expecting myself 
to get into that place of feeling overwhelmed and I'm fighting it and I'm fighting it. And the more I fight it, the more I actually feed it. So resilience comes from not avoiding and walking on eggshells around any child or student, but to say to them, when you're challenged and you get overwhelmed, I'm going to model for you what it means to feel calm. We're going to get through this together, and then we're going to reflect on it. That's how we build resilience. And that's also how we build that window of tolerance that we talk about. What is that? So many mental health people talk about that. You know, in, 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 in OT language, we talk about sensory modulation and having a just right balance. In mental health language, we talk about window of tolerance. Well, they're kind of the same. It's the balance of the gas. Acceleration, deceleration. Acceleration will give us the sympathetic arousal. Deceleration will give us more access to the parasympathetic calm system. The window of tolerance is that we all have a window where it actually helps us to understand how much I can tolerate of a certain situation and how much I cannot. So we want to get there. I'm going to give you the words of Daniel Siegel. When we attune with others, now attunement is what I'm talking about, when we're staying contingent to the child and staying connected with the child in the moment of the frustration, we allow our own internal state to shift. I must shift to the mind of the child to come to resonate with the inner world of another. This resonance is at the heart of the important sense of feeling felt. I like those words, right? How do you feel felt with each other in a given moment? And this emerges in close relationships. Children need attunement to feel secure and to develop well. And throughout our lives, we need attunement to feel close and connected. We all want our children to perform in a certain way. We want our students to do well. We want them to be well adjusted. We want them to do things to the best degree possible. When we connect, we can correct. But if the child does not connect to your correction, you find yourself next week in the same situation again. I'm not saying this is a magic bullet. I'm not saying it's going to work overnight. But more experiences of that attunement supports the child for self-regulation far more than any teaching strategy, any breathing strategy. Relationship matters. Connection matters. Always remember, connection before correction. See you next time.